Hello, Internet! My name is Catherine Barsonistas, and you are watching The Gluttonous Geek Presents Munchies and Minis, a cooking show where I make recipes inspired by various role-playing games, uh, such as Dungeons & Dragons, Pathfinder, Pugmire, and occasionally Shadowrun. You know, if you happen to put food into that game, I'll try to make it. But anyway, today we are going back to Dungeons & Dragons. Again, I know, I've been kind of hooked on the Forgotten Realms campaign uh, setting recently because, well, Baldur's Gate 3 uh, early release is out. And, oh my gosh, that game can suck up so many hours. You've, If you've played any Baldur's Gate game before, you would understand. Um, but... I was also taking this advantage to go through uh, some of the Volo's guides and of like various regions in the Forgotten Realms setting in Faerun. Um, Volo's guides, as I've probably explained in previous videos, is kind of like a Faerunian uh, travel guide, Yelp sort of thing, where he basically uh, Volo the Bard, which, funnily enough, you actually meet in Baldur's Gate 3 goes from city to city along the Sword Coast, the Dale Lands, Cormier, uh, even Anxala from the Baldur's Gate 2 fame, and just reports on the various inns, um, site, uh, sites to see, taverns, and uh, fest halls, i.e. brothels, uh, that you can find in these various cities. Today's recipe for Feldpost, a Feldpost Inn Fireside Tarts comes from Feldpost Inn and Baragost, which is featured in Volo's Guide to the Sword Coast, uh, which the past couple of recipes I've done have also been from the same book. Um, now, Felt uh, Baragost is right outside, uh, outside of Baldur's Gate, kind of between Baldur's Gate and, um, uh, well, yeah. This, the country of Am, which is south, just south of Baldur's Gate. Uh, so it's kind of interesting because Am is very similar in flavor text to medieval Spain, while Baldur's Gate kind of, it kind of has that sort of French sort of feeling, French and English, especially northern France, um, sort of uh, flavor text to it. Um, if you look at all the various descriptions in Baldur's Gate. Baragost, I figure, being in between uh, that region, essentially France slash Brittany, and Am, um, i.e. Spain, I figure there would be some flavors to go um, that would be in that sort of provincial France, kind of border between that and Spain sort of region, that kind of Mediterranean coastal region, um, especially since we're going off the Sword Coast. So um, that's what we're looking at probably for around Baragost, especially in their uh, very, very strong farming community. Um, there's only one tavern in Baragost call, uh, called the Flaming Mage, which is kind of hilarious considering that Baragost is especially known for a uh, wizarding school, well, um, a wizarding school that was burned to the ground. So, yeah, that's tasteful. Um, <laughs> but uh, so the what's it called? The, the flaming mage doesn't actually serve food. They happen to get food from the various inns that happen to be nearby. One of which is the Feldpost Inn. Feldpost Inn. I'm going to just go ahead and read the description off for you from Volo's Guide to the Sword Coast, is named for its now deceased founder. This old and comfortable pl is this is an old and comfortable place. Service is careful and kindly. It is a trifle slow, but a room comes with fire, a light except in hot weather, and a bath that is skillfully filled to one's own taste in warmth by several old men, many smiles, but few words. And I admit I did have to read that sentence a couple of times to figure out, no, it's old men bringing hot water to the bath not old men sitting in the bath to warm it up. Ew. Um, right. Uh, one can even request assistance bathing. All this makes for a, uh, this place a favorite with the elderly and so makes for a quiet stay. The food is superior. Don't miss the cheese and, the cheese and cucumber buns or the onion and mushroom fireside tarts served to all by the hearth in the evenings. The tarts are free if you are ordering drinks, and the inn cellar includes an excellent sherry. And I will admit it was that particular note about the sherry that kind of figured, like, made me figure that there would be some Spanish elements in this recipe, especially since sherry is 
most linoleum towards a two, from two Spain. So we're going to be using some dry sherry uh, with our mushrooms and caramelized onions, as well as including a bit of orange zest and juice. Once again, a very Spanish flavor and um, Spanish paprika, which Spanish. But uh, since we also have a little bit of the French and English stuff going on as well, uh, we're going to be using some Herbes Provence for that kind of provincial French sort of flavor, as well as um, in like in the mushrooms, as well as in the tarts themselves. Now, uh, you're probably thinking, well, how is this tart going to be cooked by the fireside? Well, about that, we're actually going to be making Yorkshire puddings, which I know English, but a Yorkshire pudding, uh, the name especially if you're an American, uh, seems a little, huh? you're pudding with mushrooms, ew. Uh, no, it is actually a dough that has been, it's kind of like a popover where you heat up fat stupidly hot in a tin and then you pour this kind of egg bat, egg and milk batter into it and it creates these fun little popovers that then after they come out of the oven, the middle sinks in, which is really kind of cool because then you can put all sorts of fillings in it. In this particular case, we're going to be using caramelized onions and mushrooms. So I've been blathering on quite a bit. It's probably about time we start making this, especially if we're going to have enough time to caramelize our onions. So let's go ahead and get started. Switch to our prep cam for a couple of things that you are going to need. First of which is onions. You're going to use about a pound and a half of onions. Feel free to use sweet onions if you'd like. Uh, I'm using regular yellow onions because it's more often used in Spanish cooking. Um, and also, they're inexpensive. And I am not made of money. So, I am made of meat and mushrooms and other things. Right, uh, so... Uh, quick tutorial on how to hold a uh, kitchen knife properly. As you see, I am not doing this. Do not do that. Your knife will slip right out of your hands if it hits something and just... No, don't do that. What you want to do is put the index finger of your dominant hand, in my case it's my right hand, put that up against the blade right here, close to the handle, put your thumb there, and then comfortably wrap your fingers around the handle and as you can see it's not staying completely straight that's fine you just need to have a good hold not a death grip mind you just enough to keep um just enough to keep good control on it so i mean for example if i just happen to shift this around it's not going anywhere if something really does slip it doesn't take me much effort whatsoever for me to keep control of my blade as opposed to if i'm my finger here it's gonna slip no matter how hold no matter how tightly I hold that handle. See? I mean I am giving it a death grip right now. See what I mean? There you go. Right, so we're just gonna cut the butt end off of this onion here to make it a little easier to peel. And a big thing with making knife cuts is creating stable surfaces. And measure uh, stable and measurable surfaces. So I'm just going to cut this in half to once again create a stable surface. And if you're a little nerved out about uh, having your hand so close to the knife when you slice this, uh, it's good to keep the peel on because then you can just peel it back and try to keep it as intact as possible. Since this one's kind of papery in some ends, we're just going to get that top layer off. Just move that all the way back, like so. And then just hold on to those peeled bits as you slice thinly, keeping your hand far away from the knife's edge, like so. And you can just either throw that out or freeze it, which I am actually far behind on making my stock, but freeze it in a um, freezer bag with all your other vegetable scraps and, and chicken bones, beef bones, whatever. Make yourself some homemade stock in the crock pot. But we're not going to really need to do that for a while because, well, I am... Uh, 
I've got like three bags of scraps that I need to turn into stock, so we're not doing that today. We're just gonna give this back to the landfill and the earth to create hopefully better soil, which in the landfill, eh, this is why you need to vote green, people. Okay. Come on. Just gonna pull that back again. Yeah, just to reiterate, it is a pound and a half of either yellow or sweet onions. I'm just gonna slice thinly. Trust me, it it will cook down. It looks like a lot, but it will cook down, dang it. So, let's toss that into a bowl. Okay. Yeah. Once again, slice off the top. Oof, that one's starting to turn on me. Right, we are tossing this onion. Good thing I've got another one. There we go. Cut that in half. Peel off the papery bits. Also, a uh, big thing about cutting is you need to make sure that your knives are sharp. And by doing that, uh, you're less likely to, one, have your knife slip and cut your hand off. And two, you're also less likely to have your onions make you cry as you're cutting them. The thing is, when you cut an onion, Compounds from the onion interact with the liquid in your eye, in your tear ducts, creating sulfuric acid. Which, that's what makes you cry, because there's acid in your eyes. However, the less cellular damage that you uh, do to an onion is less, uh, is going to release fewer of those fumes and less likely to make you get acid in your eyes, pretty much. So... Sharp knives, fewer cuts, less crying. Okay. Okay. So I'm listening to the music right now, and it's kind of funny because it's sort of a mystical version of the Tetris theme. Funny thing about that song, it's actually a Slavic folk song called Karabushka. It's not, it wasn't written for Tetris. And, uh, when I was a musician at the Georgia Renaissance Festival, we played it pretty much every darn weekend. It was fun. Okay. And this is our last onion. Okay. 
three bits away from there. Yeah. And that's it for our onions. Oh, yeah, now it's starting to create sulfic acid, sulfuric acid in my eyeballs. So, it's time to move this over here. Oof, to get those fumes out of my face. Because that's not fun. Oof. Alrighty. Fumes are out of my face and off my hands. So now we just have to cut up our mushrooms. Big thing about cooking is that it's made a lot easier, especially when it comes to timing, if you do all your prep ahead of time. Also, make sure to read your recipe card all the way through before you start cooking. So, mushrooms. We got about eight ounces here since these will also cook down quite a bit. I am going to, I think, dice up all of them. And you still want it to be, for the most part, recognizable. But, keep in mind these are going to cook down quite a bit. So, you do not want to rinse the dirt off your mushrooms because Mushrooms act like sponges. They will absorb whatever moisture you happen to get on them. So what I'm doing is just brushing the dirt off with a paper towel. It's rough enough to have a little bit of our, uh, abrasion, as you can see. But, you know, not adding extra moisture to the mushrooms. So. And they do make brushes to do this, but personally, I don't really like to get multitaskers, oh, sorry, unitaskers, because they take up extra space in my cabinets. I mean, some... I will accept some unitaskers, like, I do have a garlic press, but I found that if you're using it regularly, it's worth it. Oof. Still some of that acid in my eyes. Oof. Man. But yeah, paper towel does the job. One more. All right, I'm just gonna get that dirt out of the container since I'm gonna be using it as a prep dish. You know, save myself a dish and get the excess dirt off my cutting board. There you go. Okay, so I'm just gonna first have these 
I want to cut about half inch thick slices on them. So you're just going to kind of eyeball that and then use the other slices to approximate their thickness. And that's the thing, you, you want it around the same thickness just because it cooks down uh, more evenly. There we go. And like I said, a lot of cutting is creating stable surfaces, sta uh, sorry, stable and measurable surfaces. So. So, next point of order is that we need to first cook down our mushrooms. Um, oof, man, still got some of that dirt on there. <laughs> so, what I need to do is first, um, I'm going to go ahead and switch to our stove cam so you, see, I guess, see what I'm doing. Uh, I'm going to preheat our skillet here over medium heat uh, for about three minutes to get it good and hot. Um, while I'm waiting, we're just going to do a wee bit more prep. So, we are going to be creating the liquid that our onions are going to be cooking in. So, after that, you'll need an orange. <laughs> an orange. Some dry sherry. Where do my spices go? They were right here. Ah, they're under my eggs. Some Spanish paprika and some herbs to Provence. We are going to be adding to our little bowl here. Well, first we're going to need some measuring spoons. So, you are going to need a teaspoon, which this is a teaspoon. That's half a tablespoon. That is not a teaspoon. Is this? That is half a teaspoon. Yeah, um, the marks have long faded, so my husband had to go in with a paper clip and scratch out the measurements on these things. So, here we go. A teaspoon of Herbes de Provence. Let's see. Teaspoon Spanish paprika. Actually, screw it. We'll do a teaspoon and a half of Spanish paprika. I'll just update my recipe here. One and a half teaspoon of Spanish paprika. And see so to that once I rinse it off. We are going to be adding hey. <sighs> a 
a quarter cup of dry sherry. And we're going to be doing the juice of an orange, but first I need to zest it, which I'm going to go ahead and do directly into our all-purpose flour, which we have a three, uh, three quarters of a cup of in this bowl right here. And where did I put... Ah! I had to wash it off earlier, so that's why that's there. Okay. So, got our zester here. I'm just going to... Whew. All right, so our timer's gone off on our stovetop. Our skillet should be nice and hot, so I'm going to be adding about two tablespoons of... unsalted butter to our pan. I'm just going to make sure that's enough. Yeah. So, there's two tables uh, there's two tablespoons. I just need to have that Oh wait. Stupid Nate, that is not correct. Actually, I'm going to be cooking these mushrooms dry. I'll have to add more butter. The thing is, like I said about mushrooms, they tend to absorb whatever liquid you put on there. So those are going to absorb some butter. But, we actually need to cook out the majority of that moisture before I can add onions, which I'm actually going to do after I do the mushroom. Uh, I've got to take the mushrooms out first. Sorry, my brain's kind of like, ooh. Anyway, as we're waiting for that to cook down and cook out, I'm just going to go ahead and continue to zest our orange. Quick look at our mushrooms, see how those are doing. They're browning up nicely, but as you can see, a lot of that moisture is starting to come out. We want to cook it down until these suckers have shrunk. and it is for the most part done cooking in its own moisture. So, go back and get, go ahead and get those back into a single layer. And this adds some really nice browning flavor to our mushrooms without making them slimy, which I notice is uh, a lot of the complaints that people have about eating mushrooms if, you know, they happen to hate them. I love them, but not everyone likes their texture and that's because a lot of times when you have mushrooms that are that texture it's because they've basically been stewed they've absorbed so much moisture that they don't get any browning just that texture without the browning so i want sorts of butter i don't uh, care as much for uh, shiitake for the texture uh shiitake is one of those you're also gonna have to um it called brown a bit first but I will say that the the ones that are probably the most notorious for tasting slimy if you don't cook the moisture out first before adding any kind of fat are cremeni mushrooms i.e. baby bella so there you go okay. all right so our orange is zested directly into our flour. I'm just going to toss that together. So now I just need to juice it. So I'm just going to cut the ends off. Let's 
slice it in half, and then put it directly into our juicer, which you want to put the smaller end on the bottom, believe it or not. juice it most thoroughly. We're wanting to check on those mushrooms, I think. Let's go back to our... Alright. These are looking excellent so far. Still need to cook a bit longer. Okay, that is one half of our orange. Now for the next half. Don't need that anymore. And I'm just gonna whisk that around with a fork. And let that sit. Off to the side as I wait for the pan to become available again. And as you see, these there's a lot of water coming out of these mushrooms. I mean, I didn't really need to add any fat whatsoever because <laughs> this seeps right out. But don't worry, there will be butter. We will have flavor infused into these mushrooms. Oh, man. They smell awesome right now, though. All right, where did I put my lemonade? Lemonade! Lemonade. Here's my lemonade. Okay. And right now I am drinking lemonade with gin and creme de violet. It is delightful. Okay. What was I doing? Right. I... Just gotta stir that up. Let's check those mushrooms again. A good way to tell if your mushrooms have do are done is if the sizzling slows down. Because then most of the moisture is out of it. The thing is that sound you're hearing is the sound of water escaping and boiling off from these little sponges of umami because that's what they are mm. so that, mm. back to our batter for now. Just gonna kind of blend that orange zest in, as well as two teaspoons of Herbs de Provence. So one, two, three, four. Oh wait, that's a quarter teaspoon. <laughs> One, two. Okay, it sounds like the sizzling has slowed down some. Oh, right, and you also need to 
pinch of kosher salt. Let's see, back to our mushrooms. Yep, sizzling has definitely slowed on those. You don't really see much moisture coming out of them anymore. That means it is time to remove them from the pan. Back to a separate dish. And we've returned, we actually put that butter into the pan and we let that melt. Just kind of coat the whole bottom of our skillet with it. And once the butter is all melted and foaming, that is when you add your onions. Mm, it is picking up the mushroom brown from pan as I'm putting this butter in and I can definitely smell it as it melts. Okay, now I need to add the onions and kind of toss that to coat in our melted butter. Actually, come think of it, it's probably going to be another tablespoon of butter. It's a little bit cooked off. So now I'm just going to turn on the timer for about five minutes. sure the whole lot is coated in butter. And those mushrooms that I cooked earlier, I'm just going to add them to the same bowl that I had the onions in earlier, and I'm going to cover that up with a plate to keep it warm. And I hope this plate is large enough, though it probably isn't. plate is large enough. So that's going to cover our mushrooms to keep it warm. I'm just going to mute for a second because I need to blow my nose. All right, and we're back sound-wise. Toss that container because I don't need it anymore. And give the onions a toss to get a little bit more browning. how we are doing with our other things. I've got two minutes left on that, so there are a few things I need to put together for our batter. I'm just going to wait a little bit longer before I get to. 
Okay, so you're gonna need three eggs. These are large eggs. And no, you're not going to separate the, uh, the egg and the yolk. You're going to be using the whole thing. So, just gonna get that in there. Two. And three. Now that fork I was using earlier, I'm just gonna use it. these eggs. Alright, how are we doing on time? We got a minute left. Give those a toss. those eggs I'm gonna be adding or at least pouring three quarters of a cup of whole milk which I might it's not gonna fit into that bowl but it will into the main bowl of batter, so we're just going to hold off on that until we get to the next step with our onions. Alright, so our timer has gone off. And we've had a bit of browning on our onions, but now I'm just going to be first adding a pinch of kosher salt. Or two pinches turning our heat down to medium low. Give that a good stir. And this is when we wait to the point where the onions actually start sticking to the pan. We haven't gotten to that point yet. So I'm just going to let them continue to cook at that temp, stirring every once in a while until the onions start sticking. Okay, so now we need to assemble our batter. You've got your flour, salt, and herbs Provence mix right here. So, first I'm just gonna pour in my egg. And then, rinse out my egg bowl with the milk. Hold on to the measuring cup because you're going to need that to pour into our muffin tins. So now I'm just going to mix in with our fork. To make sure there's no lumps and everything is incorporated. Okay, so that is mixed in, and now I'm just going to set a timer for 30 minutes because we need to let our batter rest for half an hour. But that's okay because we also need a little bit of time for one, our oven to preheat because it takes a little time, like usually about 15, uh, 18 minutes for your oven to preheat to about 400 degrees, especially if it happens to be an electric oven like mine is. So I'm just going to set a timer for 30 minutes and set, well, I'm going to wait a bit before I preheat my onions. Okay, looks like we are getting some stickage and possible burnage, so this is when we start adding that mix I showed you earlier with our sherry orange juice. So I'm just going to add is that half a tablespoon? Yes, that is. 
uh, about a tablespoon and give it a stir. And set the timer for about five minutes. And every time you see the, uh, and I'll also add another pinch of salt. If you're worried about it being too salty, don't. Kosher salt is the least salty of culinary salts. Let's see here. Oh! We are going to ban you, Mr. Sir Senior so Antisocial. That is, if I can. Can I ban you? Let's see. Block. Yep. Locked. Okay. Is that my hair right now? Oof. Alright, we're gonna add a little bit more of that liquid, I think. It's cooking a lot faster than I was anticipating. Turn the heat down a little bit lower. So I think it's just very, very uh, hot right now. Oh boy. Right. So, just to make sure that I have everything else ready to go, I'm going to get another tablespoon of butter. No. Let's get two just in case. I'll just stick that on top of our plate and get the rest of the butter in the fridge because we don't need it anymore. Or at least we don't need to measure it anymore. Okay. And just set up the next start uh, step of the process here. And that is prepping our pan to go into the oven. So you're going to need a 12 cup muffin tin. Let's add a little bit more of that. It's starting to slow its simmering. a lot faster than I was anticipating, admittedly. Oh, gosh. One of the few places I lack a sword to smite. Well, maybe that'll change at some point, but you know, Strike, you've got enough on your plate. I don't need you to add you, uh, I don't need you to add moderating my channel to your list. Mm. Considering I got so very few people in here at the moment. Alright, so... Switching back, we have our muffin tin. Now, for a good Yorkshire pudding, you either want to use uh, beef drippings, bacon fat, or lard. Um, you can use butter. You can use all. Uh, you can use oil, just not olive oil because of its low smoke point. Um, but we're going to be using rendered bacon fat. Um, and 
yeah, um, we're going to be adding about a tablespoon. Oh wait, no, it's a teaspoon. Teaspoon, not tablespoon. Yes, teaspoon of bacon fat to each cup. That is, we will, after we deglaze the skillet again. Give that a stir. And a pinch of salt. And I'm going to set the timer for another two minutes. And in the meantime, I'm also going to wait. I'll do that. At, I'll preheat the oven in a little bit. But first, go ahead and prep our pan. So we're going to be adding a teaspoon of bacon fat to each cup. You can always also use duck fat if you happen to have it. Ghee could also taste rather nice. I wish I had another recipe to show you guys tonight. Just uh, still working my way through certain books and games, trying to find other stuff to cook. And like, I'm halfway through Lovecraft Country at the moment, and I haven't really. I think the show actually shows more food than the books do. To be the book does, to be honest with you. Okay, perfect timing. Let's switch back. Oof. This is definitely that low and slow part I was telling you about with caramelizing onions. Give that a stir. Pinch of salt. And let it continue to cook. Okay. So, so I was thinking after we talked yesterday, what about giving a glam over to some of those Dragonlance recipes? You know, that's actually not a bad idea. Um, now that I've got, uh, is it in at the last home? Um, I should start trying to sort of recreate those recipes, or rather make them more, make them usable for home cooks. And it's kind of, yeah, um, leaves from the end of the last home. Yeah, um, it's funny you mention that, because I remember a Reddit thread a while ago of people wanting to, um, like, uh, the, qu uh, the Reddit post was fantasy fans. What dish would you like to see recreated uh, from your favorite books? And I mean, the reason why I even found this Reddit thread is because they mentioned uh, Max Steak Sandwich from the Dresden Files. 
But they also, and uh, then someone linked my site with my steak sandwich recipe. Um, but yeah, um, they also mentioned spiced potatoes for uh, from End of the Last Home. And uh, yeah, it Strike says um, in the chat, uh, spiced potatoes in this book anyway, uh, is just potatoes with cayenne like woo. Yeah, no, it's um, it's kind of crazy that they do that. And I'm going to have to look a little bit more to Dragonlance lore because the thing about paprika is that it's it's a new world item, technically. It's usually made from bell peppers. I mean, it's just kind of dried peppers that have then been ground. And I mean, that's great and all, but it's not like unless you're kind of going for sort of a Spanish or Slavic sort of tastes, it's it's kind of so-so. An interesting thing I found out from um, Chelsea of In at the Crossroads, the blog In at the Crossroads, she uh, did the official uh, Game of Thrones cookbook as well as the official uh, World of Warcraft cookbook, Firefly cookbook, Skyrim cookbook, all of that stuff. Um, she was like looking up trying to find stuff for Witcher stuff, and ran into the same problem I was with. There are no medieval recipes on record from Poland, and the reason for that is because a good part of the National Archive got burned by the freaking Nazis. So that's why you don't see it. Like, there's the, a lot of the source material got burned. Um... If you need more info on Kryn, let me know. I was potentially somewhat obsessive as a young boy. Okay, we will talk, sir. We will definitely talk. And I am going to preheat my oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Because we need to get that oven good and hot for our Yorkshire pudding part of the recipe. And I forgot to put a timer on this. But it's okay. We're just going to raise the heat just a wee bit. A little bit. Yeah, GD Nazis, yep. That's definitely, yeah. Nazis ruin everything, don't they? I thought, yeah. Um, let's see, we still have 17 minutes left on our batter. Which is fine, because it's going to take a bit of time for our fat to melt, about 5 to 7 minutes, for our fat to melt and get hot in our oven. So that's going to take up some of the time. But yeah. Um, I mean, what I ended up doing for Witcher was kind of... The recipe mentioned in the book was for hazel grouse, which I found out later was the actual type of bird. But considering that there's they mention hazel kind of all throughout that section of the chapter, I'm figuring, you know... Maybe they also use hazelnuts with their pen, with their grouse. So I made Cornish game hens, but I tried making it um, in the style of Polish wedding chicken, which is actually a Polish American recipe. And it ended up good. Um, I kind of want to revisit at some point, especially if I can uh, kind of not take the advice of the Polish wedding chicken recipe as much. <laughs> Let's see, uh, Strike says punching Nazis ought to be our Gara national pastime. Amen to that. Oh gosh. This is looking and smelling excellent, I'm not gonna lie. I'm gonna taste one. That is good, but it definitely needs to caramelize a little bit longer. So, just gonna stir what's left of that. We're just gonna let it cook and do its thing. 
So I'm going to turn the heat back down to low and add some more salt. Trust me, it's going to need it. Tasting really good. Mm. Oh boy. Right, so 14 minutes left on the clock. Maybe I can make myself some kind of cocktail in the interim. So let's see, I've got some dry sherry. And I have some mezcal. I do, could, do, I guess I could do kind of a Maze Tika and Amnish sort of fusion cocktail recipe, maybe. And smokiness with a sherry could be pretty interesting, not gonna lie. Okay, let's do that. Some mezcal, some dry sherry. I already used up that orange, but I've got plenty of limes here. So right now we've got our Maestica and a lime for our, I mean, our mezcal and a lime for our Maestican. Got some sherry and other Spanish things do I have in here? I think I've got a blood orange that I bought earlier. Um, hmm. <laughs> hmm. Got pimentos. I mean, I guess that could work. Maybe some cider? I mean, that could be good. Hmm. Okay. Experiment time. So let me get a shaker wherever my shaker went. Do I still have one out here? Shaker, shaker, shaker. Ha, yes, shaker. All right. Let's give this a shot. All right, first, get myself. Actually, you know what? Screw it. Let's do the let's do the blood orange. Oh, I already put my juicer away. Hmm. Hey, Chip Tune Brony, it's good to see ya. Now, I originally bought this blood orange today because I was going to use it in today's recipe, but uh, I kind of forgot that I already had another orange in the fridge, which actually worked out better. I mean, the whole reason why I bought the blood orange was because. That was the only orange that wasn't in a bag um, at Fresh Market today. I normally don't shop at Fresh Market, but it worked out for today. So, got ourselves, let's see, a blood orange, which got a citrus reamer and just gonna juice that directly into our shaker. Don't worry about getting pulp or seeds in there because we're gonna be straying it out. And that should equal to about, goodness, I think that should equal out to about an ounce because it's normally about, well, no, no, we're looking at probably two ounces because an orange normally contains about four to five ta uh, tablespoons of orange juice, and an ounce equals to about two tablespoons of liquid. So, so if you're wanting to take notes of my my experiment right now, I just put about two ounces of blood orange juice into our shaker. Next juice of one lime, which should equal to about an ounce. Usually there's about two tablespoons worth. And I'm not as worried about seeds or anything because 
Sometimes limes are kind of seedless. Finally made some delicious mythic cookies. Hmm. What uh what is myth what are mythic cookies from? Just gonna give our onions another stir. Those are cooking down nice. I'm just gonna show you how our onions are cooking down real quick here. Doesn't that look pretty? Okay. So that's that one half of a lime. There's the other one. All right, so we've got about six, sorry, uh, three ounces of liquid in there currently. We're gonna go for a standard eight ounce cup. We're gonna want about five more ounces of things or about four more. So let's go with Air on the side of caution more with the sherry than the mezcal because it's not as high of liquor content. So let's um, let's do this is a two ounce. I think this is an ounce. That's an ounce. Two ounces of sherry. Oh, trials of mana. Yeah, I. I mean, I will admit that I um. Let's do an ounce of. Mezcal. I'm just gonna give that a quick taste, see if I need to add any syrup to it. Yep, it's gonna need some syrup. So I'm just gonna add a touch of agave syrup. Since we already got some mezcal in there. And that should be about a half an ounce. I just poured in which IE tablespoon. Alright. Give that another shake. Cheers. Turned out good. Could probably use a little bit more agave syrup, but I'm not complaining. Get that a rinse. And now we're gonna check back up on our onions. But yeah, I actually started watching the playthrough of Trials of Mana. And I just haven't had the chance to put it on in the background yet. Because I will admit, I was... Because it's a Japanese RPG, I was originally just going to... Um, what's it? Make kind of a Japanese sort of take on a honey drink. But... Looking at how the actual gameplay is, especially since it starts out with the... Um, Kind of the redhead Goku looking character. Um, the stuff they're showing so far seems very kind of German Slavic. So I don't. I've actually held back on uh, on making it because I want to watch it a little bit more to be able to figure out the flavors right for it. Um, I'm thinking chamomile might be pretty good but once again I'm gonna have to look it up because I kind of thinking okay so it's probably a take on kind of like a folk cure like kind of a Germanic folk remedy with honey which is kind of interesting considering that honey is really a stupidly healthy food and not just because you think it's healthier. It's honey is antimicrobial, antifungal, which a lot of times poultices would be honey-based, 
because of their antiviral, antibacterial, and antifungal properties. Okay, our temp is at 400 degrees, and these onions are pretty darn cooked. So, I'm going to transfer my onions to my bowl of mushrooms that I cooked earlier. transfer the whole lot of it in there. Then I'm going to add that two tablespoons of butter. Give that a stir. And then cover up the bowl that I had those onions in with a plate to keep it warm and also to let the butter melt. So, mm, that's heating up um, to, so I can clean it. That means it is time to get our muffin tins into the oven. If you're just joining us, I just put about a teaspoon of bacon fat into each one of these cups in my muffin tin. Uh, make sure that it is metal. Do not use ceramic because you're putting it into an oven at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm just going to set a timer up here because I already got the batter one going for about five minutes to keep an eye on it and get to cleaning this skillet. Oh, right. I'm going to wait that last three minutes for my batter to rest before I transfer it to my measuring cup. Give this a toss, put stuff back, clean things up. And let's see, where are my pot holders? Here's a pot holder. Here's the thing I don't need anymore. Here's the thing I don't need anymore. Here's a thing I don't need anymore. Yes, big thing about cooking, clean as you go. Save yourself some frustration and time. Mm. Tasty. Right, I was doing things. I was finding the other pot holder. So I need to clean this skillet. That is good and hot. going to add some salt to the pan. Dry up this extra bits and extra oil and all that. towels. Get those last little bits up. Turn the heat off. And then give it a spray of cooking spray to re-season. Another paper towel. Rub that all in there.
and then shift the pan off the burner to cool and soak in that oil. Okay, so our first timer went off and that should be for our batter to have rested. So we are back with our batter, which I'm just gonna pour into our measuring cup. Like a spatula for easier handling. Okay. Cool. So that way it's much easier to pour into these very, very hot um, muffin tin, which got about less than a minute on. Wow. Okay. Time does go real by really fast. Okay. Mm. I think... That's fine how it is. Okay, so just making sure that my space is clear here so you can see what I'm doing. And also shifting this camera up to look up at my oven. There we go. Wow, we're actually making stupid time tonight. Mmm. Okay, so let's just switch the cam really quick so you can see what I'm doing. And just make sure my sound's working. Okay, all right, so at this point, your, the bacon fat in the muffin tin should not only be melted, it should be piping hot and kind of smoking, which it is not currently. It's just very hot. So we're going to put it on for another two minutes to get it stupidly hot. That way it cooks up perfectly as soon as we get those poured. In the meantime, let's go ahead and check our filling. Our mushroom and caramelized onion filling made with sherry, orange juice, paprika, and herbs de Provence. I just added an extra two tablespoons of butter to the mix, and that should let the flavors marry nicely. I'm just going to give that a quick taste, see how it turned out, see if I need to add any more salt. Mm. It's good. It just needs a touch more salt, especially since it is going to be absorbing that. And you're also going to be serving these inside of our Yorkshire puddings. So, once again, giving that a stir, stir, stir. Cover with the plate to keep it warm again. Well, I should have switched cameras on you. Well, you'll see in a minute. Because I'll bring it back as soon as I get these things in the oven. And I am definitely smelling that bacon fat now. Let's switch back to our stove cam. Hi, Ginger. How are you, my pretty kitty girl? Okay. Not quite. Let's get it that last half a minute. Did you just squeak at me, baby girl? Are you my squeaky princess? Come here, squeaky princess. This is my little girl, Ginger. And she's squeaking at me. Because she smells bacon. Yeah. Okay, baby girl. All right. Back to our stove cam. Okay. That. You know what? I'll take it. That should be stupidly hot. Be careful as you handle it. Because, like I said, it's stupidly hot. Oh boy. Okay. So, 
back to our prep cam. And this is when we're going to want to divvy up. As you see, it is, I just need to fill each cup about halfway. too much. Cool. All right, so now back into the oven we go for another about 10 minutes, let's say. Hi, Ginger. Need you to move. So I'm going to set the timer for about 10 minutes. And I can show you that uh, filling I was telling you about real quick here. Alrighty, here we are. As you see, we added another two tablespoons of butter to our whole mix, as well as some more kosher salt. And I am just going to cover that back up again to keep it warm while we wait for our Yorkshire puddings to cook. And try not to trip over my cat in the process. Because <laughs> yeah, she smells that bacon fat. And here is the absolute golden rule of Yorkshire puddings. Do not open that oven for at least another 10 minutes. Otherwise, they will fall and you'll be very disappointed. But, like I said, a lot of stuff's clean to go. So let's go ahead and get cleaning while I ramble. So, spiced potatoes, eh? strike from Dragonlance in the last home. Well, um, question about where in the last home is located. What earth culture would you say is the closest uh, to what's being depicted in, in uh, at end of the last home? Because that can give me a bit of an idea of what kind of flavors we're actually going to be expecting. As well as... Um, as well as their cooking method. It can also... Help me determine what kind of potato and also if I start... If I don't just do potatoes. See, solace of the town tree houses and a crossroad. Okay. So forest region. Got it. So we're uh, it's described as sort of the place that enough travelers pass through an inn of that size and would probably definitely be on the trade routes, I imagine, to be able to handle or at least be able to afford those spices. I imagine I imagine also that merchants would probably be trying to empty out their stock of spices that are about to go bad that didn't get purchased on the last trade run. And that's probably how they're able to offer it up as a regular menu item. Um, but otherwise a small town sort of place. Okay, so it almost sounds like it would be... Um, 
I would have to read about the regions that surround it and like travel, like have caravans going along those roads because that could definitely influence the, um, the spices that come through. I am at, <laughs> it actually could be pretty funny if I sort of label it as a, they just have a spice jar that they toss whatever spices they get cheap and to just kind of shake it all up and toss the roasted potatoes in. But okay, forest region. So we're going to want some root vegetables that happen to grow, that grow well within shaded areas. So, I mean, considering, not put that past anyone in Absalon, yeah. I mean, that's, it's the reality of running a restaurant sometimes. You cook with whatever you can get cheap. Um, so, yeah, um goodness it probably would be a collection of root vegetables because stuff that would be able like, to grow well within shaded areas or in a temperate zone at the least I mean potatoes definitely do fit the bill but once again we're looking at a new world item but I also have to think about my uh, my demographic here too so maybe a combination of russets and golden potatoes or ooh if I do like a mix of gold potatoes and rutabaga that could be pretty interesting um, and then do kind of a mix like a I need to look up some other I need to look up some other uh, spice blends than just Poudre Fort but kind of what they used um okay so i will i'll give this a shot i will read that end of the last leaves in the last home and i'll continue to shoot you question strike because that that sounds like a pretty darn good side dish for this weekend if i have a chance to run out and get some potatoes on the way back from my uh brother-in-law's baby shower tomorrow um Cause yeah, I'm gonna be an ant come December. Um, pull some detailed maps to give you a better idea of what's in and around there. Excellent. I am, I am excited about that. That sounds like fun. Um, that and considering I know it's in high demand, but yeah. Oh god, I need to read some Dragonlance novels. <laughs> There's so many books I need to read. Oh my gosh, it's kind of nutty. Oh man. Okay. Just gonna set that. Got about four minutes left on those Yorkshire puddings. If you were closer, I'd loan you my annotated, uh, annotated chronicles. Yeah. Oh gosh. I mean, there are times I wish desperately for transporter technology, because, like I said, I visited Chicago uh, last year back in April, and I want to go back. <laughs> I had so much fun. I mean, it was cold and windy and miserable, but I enjoyed the hell out of the food and beer scene and, like, the comedy scene and all that. And, I mean, and the fact that now I have more friends up there, too, even better. Let's see. Uh, that's the first trilogy. I'll see if I can find it. Um, I might have a book or two at my parents' place. Because I know that, um... Someone gave me a Dragonlance novel uh, for just because I, no, my mom got me one because she liked the cover. It was this really pretty swordswoman in kind of a conquest pose. And the trouble was, since I had never read any, um, it might be Dragons of Aut no, it can't be. Um, but yeah, I I had never read any Dragonlance series books before. It was a little hard for me to get into because I'm going what uh, huh I I don't understand <sighs> yeah um so yeah I uh back before ebooks were a thing and I was at the mercy of whatever happened to be in the local bookstore in town or uh over at Barnes and Noble all the way in Fayetteville mm. <laughs> I have fond memories of that bookstore in Peachtree City, 
there was this um, there was this guy that worked there, and I would oftentimes just go right after school to the bookstore because, um, yeah, he was like almost seven feet tall and long hair and looked like something out of a fantasy, like romantic fantasy novel, and I was smitten. Um, and he was also a huge fantasy nerd, so I would go in there and talk for hours about fantasy books, and he would keep eyes, his eyes open for uh, for titles for me. And um, my God, that was back in high school. Oh goodness, we got two minutes left on the oven. See, since Solus is one of the closest towns outside of the Elven Nation of Quelnesti, so you're probably going to have a lot of um, forest-growing herbs as well mixed into that. Or on the trade route from their big capital. Yep, it would make sense for them to be able to like, just buy spices for cheap and just toss it together. <laughs> like, look, we have it. We're going to drown potatoes in it. Look how exotic we are. Um, nestled right along a lake in Sentinel Peaks, which means they probably serve a lot of fish, too. Alright, half a minute left. 30 seconds. Oh, man. Yeah, like I said, I... I'm, uh... I need to cut up my reading. I'm currently working my way through my Dresden Files reread, and I'm on... What's it? Small Favor right now, I think. I think that's the name of it. Um, I'm also working on Lovecraft Country, and I just got the ebook of the first book of the Bridgington romance series, which is romance... Uh, a Regency era romance. Which, I don't normally read romance novels, but Netflix is about to release a television adaptation. Let's see how we're looking. It's popped up, but it's not golden brown yet, so we're just gonna check in another... Well, let's go for another three minutes. See how we look then. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, I am a sucker for Regency-era romance. Um, if you like stuff like Jane Austen and you like fantasy, there's a book uh, series, the first one, Shades of Milk and Honey, which is takes place in the Regency era, and magic is usually in the form of glamour, and it's considered a high art for young ladies to learn and impress future husbands with, such as, like, painting and embroidery. But no, you're painting with magic, so glamour. Um, which was a pretty interesting book. I, um, I highly recommend it. It's some of the best writing I've seen. Um, and, uh... But yeah, I'm a huge Austin fan, and the fact that this is going to be a Netflix series, I figure it can't hurt. So I read a sample chapter on the author's website of the first book, The Duke and I, um, of the Bridgington series, and it's it's actually marvelous, marvelously well written. I mean, I think a lot of romance novels get flack because of the whole bodice or codpiece ripper type thing, but when there's enough sarcas sarcasm in there and it's not just about the sex, I enjoy the fuck out of it. Um, figuratively and kind of literally. <laughs> um, and that's my one F-bomb for the evening. We've made it for about an hour and a half and only dropped one F-bomb. We're doing great, folks! Um, <laughs> of course, I'm also... We're in a PG-13 level. <laughs> yeah, um... So, with that... Um, I mean, I'm the kind of person who play- who, like... Plays through a lot of the Bioware games and whatnot for the romances. <laughs> what can I say? I'm a hopeless romantic. I... I love it. It's not just the... I don't play RPG for the, just the character interactions. I also want there to be some love, which uh, kind of explains my roleplay record, actually. Mm. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, Neverwinter Nights, Horde of the Underdark. I swear, one of my favorite 
uh, RPG video game romances was with uh, Val and Shadow Breath, the uh, tiefling fighter uh, slash thief. Yeah, he's he's fun and oh god, that I live for the voices. Just give me give me a sexy fantasy hero voice any day, and you have me melting on the floor. Um, <laughs> Because, yeah, I figured that I have a type, and that type is Beardy McBeardface, the fantasy hero. And if they have a sexy British accent, even better. Okay, that... I'm just gonna give that a quick... Rotate. Meh. Because some of it's golden brown, but not all of it, so... Just another two minutes. Just another two minutes to get the rest of them golden brown. We should... It's like, I found that I have a type too. Oh, you know, yeah, you do? I mean, uh... Ah, oh, gosh. I, um, I first thought I had two types. Legolas and Aragorn. And then I got older. And the clean-shaven thing doesn't really get me as much unless, you know, there's a sexy British accent to go along with it. <laughs> and then it was Gimli. Oh, God. <laughs> no, check back with me in another ten years, then I'll be all about the Gimli. Um, because I'll probably look like a, ver like a female dwarf myself in another 10 years or so, like 10 or 20 years or so. Um, gosh. Um, but yeah. That, and it's like, okay, Beardy McBeardface, the fantasy hero. But there's also a caveat to that. The smart Beardy McBeardface action hero. It's like, um night I met Carter, it's like I couldn't stop talking to him. Um, I've met guys that look like freaking Brad Pitt, and then they open their mouths. And I just... No. I... No. <laughs> I just... No. Mm -mm. Um, so John Reese davis actually... Yes, Gimli's... Gimli's actor is pretty damn hot. Um, too old for me at the moment, but, you know, if I was about 20 years older, I'd hit that. Of course, there's some that are pretty damn hot that I that wouldn't even factor in it, like, for example, Sean Connery. Heck yeah. Um, Alright, are we at a golden brown yet? That's looking pretty golden brown on the outs. I'll just give it another two minutes. We're almost there. Almost there. It's like, yep, Professor and Sliders. That's actually, that's where I recognized him from mostly. Um, yeah, I, uh, I enjoyed the heck out of some Sliders when I was a kid. Um, and a teenager. I I need to rewatch that show. It's been so long. I it was a good show. I mean, the whole con like that's where the whole concept of alternate universes really. When I first that even was a blip on my radar as far as stuff in speculative fiction. Um, childhood show for myself. Ghost Rider. Oh my God! I remember Gr Ghost Rider. I don't remember all the details of Ghost Rider, but I remember it. Um, I didn't... Because I can't remember if we had the network, or I think that something else was on a lot of times when it was on, which is why I didn't watch it as much. Ooh. Are You Afraid of the Dark? And, um... God, what's it called? Salute Your Shorts were also my jam. PBS, Yeah. I was, a, I was a big Nickelodeon watcher, um, but yeah, Are You Afraid of the Dark was, like, my favorite show ever. Uh, I even had the, the computer game, um, and there, like, for the longest year, for, like, at least a decade, I could never get past 
the Wax Museum and the Are You Afraid of the Dark computer game because it freaked me out so much. I'm a sucker for, uh, for creepy horror. Okay, that is looking pretty darn baked. So, let's shut that off and get this out of here. Whew. And what we want is it for it to cool and not down enough for it to be able to sink down and create those tasty little cups that I'm talking about. That one's at a good spot. So, I'm just going to transfer all of these to a plate as they cool. And they just pop right out of there. Okay. There you go. Just gonna move this to the sink to cool down. gonna grab another plate to do a little bit of staging. Oh god, yeah. Re totally want a reboot of Are You Afraid of the Dark? And also saying, it's where you got your crush on Jewel State long before Firefly. The crazy thing, I first saw Jewel State in the Nickelodeon show Space Cases. Okay, this... That's pretty photogenic. So is this one. And yeah, those look this looks excellent. Okay. So just going to find that. We've got our filling from earlier. So I'm just gonna take a spoon. And spoon some filling directly into each cup. Okay, now that looks, I'm not going to lie, pretty darn fantastic, but I'm going to add just an extra thing for not only some picturesque, like to make it a little more picturesque, but also to add a little bit of flavor, because one thing that happens to go really well with sherry is mustard. So I've got some old style mustard here, which that also adds kind of a French sort of element to it. Just a little touch on on these. Now, this part's completely optional. You don't need it. But it adds a little bit of extra bit of tanginess to it, which I think is fun. Awesome. And there you go. Looking very pretty. 
I'm gonna try one. Because I have not had dinner yet. So, just gonna spoon that in. So, first. Hmm. That was good. And now I'm just gonna try it with a little bit of that mustard I was showing you earlier. Amazing. Mmm. Man. And I didn't realize just how hungry I was, too. See how it is with the drink I made earlier? It actually goes very well with the drink I made earlier. Mmm. Mmm. I know. You're just hearing me make noises into the, ca into the microphone now. Mmm. So, I would like to thank you for joining me once again for Munchies and Minis. Um, I think this dish turned out perfect, and I can't wait to share it with every single one of you. But, it is less than 15 minutes to 9, and I need to get pictures of these beautiful beautiful stuffed Yorkshire puddings before it stops looking pretty. So I want to th uh, thank you again. Have a wonderful weekend. Stay tuned for next week's recipe where, dang it, I'm gonna make that milk pudding based off of Monarchies and Mal. I will, I will freaking do it. Even if I have to order the bamboo steamer off of Amazon, I will do it. Um, so, join me for that episode. And Stay safe, stay sane, stay you. My name is Catherine Burson Eastis, and have a wonderful weekend and great night. Bye.